The Chinese space program is dangerous, but not in the way that you might think. China has taken over the moon with robots, they built a space station, they've landed on Mars, and all of these major accomplishments pose a significant threat to the long-standing American dominance in outer space. China is dangerous because they are capable, but at the same time, they are reckless. And that is the real problem. Not just for us as Western people or the world as a whole, but it's the Chinese themselves that have always been in the most danger. This is a video from 1996. It shows one of the first ever launches of the Chinese Long March 3 rocket. Coincidentally, there's an American payload inside that rocket. At the time, the USA thought that the emerging Chinese rocket program might be a great opportunity for cheap rides into space until this happened. Almost immediately after liftoff, the rocket is wildly out of control. It pitches over at a steep angle as the booster engines continue to burn at full throttle. A few seconds later, the rocket is flying sideways. Then it's flying straight back down and then boom. What followed was potentially the worst spaceflight related disaster in history. The rocket landed on the nearby village of Meilin which was home to the people who worked at the rocket launch site, but also a lot of farmers and average people as well. Video captured in the aftermath of the explosion shows large buildings that were severely damaged or even flattened entirely. According to the Chinese report, six people were killed, all of them employees of the space program. They say the town was evacuated long before the rocket ignited. Western media reports have put the death toll as high as 500, but neither claim can be fully verified. But that's all in the past, right? Well, here's another video. This one is from 2025, and it shows Chinese villagers fleeing in terror as fire rains down from the sky. Yet again, the source of that flame is a Long March 3 rocket, but this time, there was no failure. That's just what happens even when the rocket works as intended. And this event has been well documented over the years. Multiple incidents where big chunks of rocket have come plummeting down from the sky, dragging long tails of orange smoke, and then smashing themselves into the mountains of the Chinese countryside. If that smoke looks toxic, that's because it is. And we will talk about that. But first, we need to understand why this keeps happening. How success and failure appear so similar, because we know that the Chinese are not stupid. They've landed on the moon, landed on Mars, built a space station. So we have to go back in time, way back actually. China might seem like a latecomer to the space race, but they were there in the very beginning alongside the Soviets and the Americans. The Chinese actually had some decent success in the late 50s and early 1960s by essentially reverse engineering Soviet rockets and making their own copies. By 1964, China was able to launch a crew of mice into orbit. When the conquest of the moon became the hot topic in the late 1960s, Chairman Mao decided that China should do it too. By 1969, China had developed a heavy lift satellite launch vehicle that they had derived from an intercontinental ballistic missile. This birthed the Long March series of rockets that continue on through today. By 1971, the Chinese were making plans for a crewed mission to space with a target date of 1973. At the same time, however, the Republic was entering the height of something called the Cultural Revolution, a pretty infamous period of unrest where Mao fought to purge all remnants of capitalism and Western ideology from Chinese culture, mostly by killing and enslaving people. It was a bad time for a lot of reasons, but it was a particularly bad era for the Chinese space program, which came to a relative halt in the 70s and pretty much died alongside Chairman Mao in 76. Then, just a couple of decades later, there was a resurrection. By the mid-90s, China had reclaimed those old launch sites and they were back in the space race, but this time with an incredible sense of urgency. By 2003, China sent their first person into low Earth orbit. This made them only the third country to have achieved independent human spaceflight. While every other nation was just hitching rides on NASA's space shuttle or the Russian Soyuz, China decided to do it on their own using the Long March 2 rocket and their own spacecraft. 
And it's within that story where we find the root of our problems. When the space race first began, the Chinese were in a rough spot, very much caught up in the middle of the Cold War. You might assume that the People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union made for natural communist allies through the conflicts of the mid-20th century, but that was not the case. While the two nations had close ties going into the 1950s, by the end of that decade, tensions were on the rise. While the new Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev was advocating for peaceful coexistence with the West, Chairman Mao was violently purging Western influence from his nation. The two rising powers essentially had different views on how to do communism, and by the 1960s, cooperation between them had transformed into outright conflict and aggression. Naturally, the Chinese weren't getting along with the Americans very well either. Their armies had fought directly against each other in the Korean War from 1950 to 53. The US had refused to recognize the Communist People's Republic as the legitimate government of China, and the Americans were able to use their diplomatic influence to block Communist Chinese representatives from entering into the United Nations until 1971. Naturally, this all resulted in a China that was paranoid, isolated, and defensive. So when it came time to build their first rocket launch pads in the early 60s, which were also serving double duty as ballistic missile firing locations, should the Cold War ever get too hot, China hid them away in mountain valleys deep in the country's interior. Of the three satellite launch complexes, two of them were built in the northern deserts near the Mongolian border. But the most well-used launch pad, Xichang, was built here, along the southern border, surrounded by lush forests, rivers, and lakes that provided fertile land for Chinese farmers. As a Cold War strategy, this made sense. Keep your rockets hidden from the enemy, keep them safe. But from the standpoint of both rocket science and public safety, this was far from ideal. When the USA first started testing ballistic missiles and rockets, they built their launch pads on the east coast of Florida. They chose this location for two reasons. One, it was about as far south as you could get on the continental United States. That's important because the Earth rotates the fastest at the equator, and your rocket can carry that additional momentum with it at launch. This also ties into reason number two. The Earth rotates from west to east. So you need to be able to launch the rocket in the eastern direction to take advantage of the rotational slingshot effect. East of Cape Canaveral is nothing but the wide open Atlantic Ocean, all the way to the African coast. And this is important because as those rockets lift off and begin ascending into space, they're going to start dropping big chunks of metal back down on the Earth. This is called rocket staging. It's an essential part of the process. Once you've burned up all of the fuel inside your rocket booster, you don't want to be dragging any dead weight all the way to space. So you cut off that first stage and let it fall back down. If a rocket lands in the ocean and no one's around to see it, does that still count as pollution? Probably yeah, but it's still better than having it fall down on land where people live. Now, Cape Canaveral is pretty much the opposite of Zhichang. It's just hanging out there like America's. But the USA had the luxury of security. They were confident enough that their military power would deter and defend against any foreign threat to the mainland. So when we flash forward to the 1990s, the Cold War is over, the Soviet Union is gone, and the threat to Chinese security goes along with it. The Americans are pretty chill now too. They're buying up cheap Chinese manufactured goods hand over fist, and China has miles and miles of southeastern coastline that would provide the ideal location to build a spaceport. But that would take time. Remember, the sense of urgency that has become a trademark of the modern Chinese space program. These guys are in a rush. The tortoise has become the hare. So they just picked up right where the Chinese rocket scientists of the 1960s had left off and returned to the old Jicheng launch site. And that was not a good foundation for a modern space program. So as these rockets lift off and fly east, they go through their staging process. The boosters use up all of their fuel and they separate and fall down. That booster is going to land somewhere in this area, the Guizhou region of southern China, about 500 kilometers west of the launch site. It's not a densely populated area, it's mostly mountains, but in almost every valley, there is a rural village or even a small city. 
Now that we understand the location crisis, we can move on to the ominous cloud of red smoke because this is what takes us from bad to worse. We know that the Chinese were competitive in the early space race, but they still lagged far behind the Soviets and Americans. A lot of that handicap came down to their rocket science. All rockets are powered by a combination of fuel and oxidizer, and in the engine design used by both Soviets and Americans, they would take pure oxygen and bring the temperature down so low that it would become a liquid. And then for fuel, you just need something that will burn. Typically, the choice here is kerosene. Then you use something called a turbo pump to combine those two liquids at high pressure in the combustion chamber of your engine and ignite the mixture. This engine design was invented in Nazi Germany. Then after World War II, it was stolen by the American and Soviet governments and put to use in their ballistic missile programs and eventually filtered through to orbital rocket technology. China didn't have the luxury of stolen Nazi rocket science, so they had to choose a more simple and accessible method to power their engines. Here's a cool science experiment. This is what happens when you combine a chemical called hydrazine with an oxidizer called nitrogen tetroxide. They spontaneously combust on contact. No source of ignition is required. Pretty cool, right? Just don't try that one at home. Not only will you burn your house down, but you'll also poison yourself. Now, all rocket fuel is toxic, but you can smell kerosene without having your lungs turn inside out. The same can't be said for hydrazine. It is so toxic and corrosive that anyone who catches a big whiff of this stuff will end up in severe medical distress or worse. It will eat your lungs like that stuff from the movie The Rock. And that is what China has been using to fuel their rockets that lift off from Zhicheng this whole time. Now, that's not to say hypergolic fuel is some primitive relic. Everybody uses it to this day. SpaceX, NASA, Europe, because the convenience of a self-combusting fuel is still incredibly useful, but it's reserved for use in outer space, where there is no air to poison. Meanwhile, the Chinese Long March 2, Long March 3, and Long March 4 all lift off from the ground in a bright red cloud of toxic smoke. And then the booster stage of those rockets, still soaked in the residue of that biohazard fuel, comes crashing down into the mountain valleys of Guizhou and releases a big burst of toxic gas on impact. That sucks, and everyone knows it. The Chinese know exactly what they're doing, but at some point three decades ago, it was decided that the risk to the public and the environment was outweighed by the reward. In this case, the reward was catching up to the American space program in a shockingly small amount of time, and then in many ways surpassing the capabilities of modern day NASA. And in the process of gaining that leg up on the competition, the Chinese did learn how to modernize their rocket program. They built a new spaceport at Wencheng on the island of Hainan, where there is nothing but wide open ocean to the east, and they've developed a new rocket, the Long March 5, that does not use hypergolic fuel. It burns liquid oxygen and kerosene, just like most other rockets. So, problem solved, right? Wrong. The Long March 5 is still a really big problem, and this time it's not just affecting Chinese villagers. This rocket is now raining down fire all around the world, so what the hell happened here? Specifically, we are looking at the Long March 5B, China's most powerful rocket to date, and it's also a very strange rocket. What the Chinese needed from this design was a way to get their Tiangong space station into low Earth orbit. Those station modules are really big and really heavy, much heavier than equivalent modules for the ISS and far beyond the capability of a standard Long March 5. China again didn't have time to design a whole new rocket, so their engineers figured out a cheat code. They eliminate the staging process from their rocket design. Now instead of separating and falling back down early in the flight, the booster just keeps on boosting all the way into space and carries the payload straight to low Earth orbit. Now, why hasn't anyone else done that before? Well, for one, there's zero versatility in a rocket like the Long March 5B. It was built for one job, put Tiangong modules into the station's low Earth orbit. It can't really do much other than that. And problem number two is logistical. They have now put a 33 meter tall, 20 ton rocket booster into orbit, and that's the same orbit as the International Space Station, many of our Earth observation satellites, and a massive constellation of SpaceX Starlinks, all of which the Long March 5B 
could just smash into by accident and trigger a catastrophe in space. But even if that doesn't happen, the 5B can't stay in orbit very long. Drag will eventually pull it down, and the result is going to be a random, chaotic re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. And that's the fun part with this. You don't know when it's going to fall down or where, but you do know it's coming. Re-entry will damage the booster, but it's way too big to just burn up, so it ends up breaking apart into big chunks of flaming metal that rain down on one unlucky region of the Earth. This has now happened four times in the past five years, and China is already planning to double the size of their Tiangong station, so it's going to happen at least three more times in the next five years. It's like Russian roulette with rocket boosters. The Chinese acknowledge this by basically just saying that 70% of the Earth is water, so it probably won't land on anyone, which is insane. But this is where we are at. We have this incredibly capable global superpower that is so focused on dominating the field of space exploration that they will pursue their own goals with reckless abandon. They don't care if space junk lands on you. They don't even care if space junk lands on their own people because it does, often. And that's not going to be changing anytime soon. So keep your head up out there.